Uh, this time, you know, you brought some really cool stuff to the table. Yeah. And one thing that really grabbed me right away was this idea, like someone back in the 1300s, way before what we usually think of as the scientific revolution, not just sort of messing around with the thought of graphs, but actually coming up with a system like super close to the charts and graphs we use every day. Yeah. Kind of blows your mind, right? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. That's exactly what we're going to, you know, dig into today. Yeah. In this deep dive. It is. And what's what's so interesting is this isn't just like a a, a random guess or something. Yeah. It's a, a whole system. And that's what we're going to unpack with Nicole Oresme. Yeah. This uh, brilliant 14th century thinker who, you know, came from pretty humble beginnings. We're talking Normandy to really shake up the the way people thought back then and the sources you've given me they show just how resilient he was how brave he was intellectually yeah and our goal here is to help you understand just how big his contributions were especially considering the time he lived in absolutely yeah it's like when you picture europe in the 1300s like it's a completely different world oh yeah you've got yeah. the church with so much power explanations for like anything in nature were usually based on superstitions instead of actually looking at what was happening yeah. It's like so different from, you know, the way we are today, like yeah. with data and everything. Totally. And yet in all of that, you have a resume yeah. popping up as this total innovator. Yeah. We're going to like track his path, see what got in his way and really zero in on how his ideas in math, yeah. physics, economics, yeah. I mean, even philosophy were so ahead of their time. Oh, yeah. It's It's about like understanding how one person, starting with what seems like you know, not much, right. can actually change the way everyone thinks. Yeah, and, and, and as we go through these sources, you'll yeah. see that Oresme, he wasn't just thinking in, in the abstract, you know. Mm. His ideas, they actually had an impact. Yeah. They influenced, like, political decisions and even challenged the norms of the time. We've got stuff here that shows his his strength, his willingness to question authority, and just how broad his interests were. That's amazing. It's a, it's a really strong example of how a curious and critical mind can leave a mark that lasts. So let's start at the beginning. Yeah, like, yeah. how did this guy, Nicola Resmi, from Normandy, no real connections, no wealth or anything, how did he become such a big name in the world of ideas? Where did it all start? Well, the sources really highlight how dedicated he was to education, That's getting the... to the College of Navarre in Paris, where he studied theology under Jean Boyden. Okay. That was a huge step for him. Yeah. But it seems like theology for a resume was just like a, a launching pad. Oh, interesting. He didn't stop there. He dove into math, physics, economics, astronomy, philosophy. It's like he was thirsty for knowledge, never satisfied. I can picture him there in yeah. Paris, just constantly questioning, trying to figure everything out. Totally. He wasn't just sitting there taking it all in. He was really wrestling with the ideas. And, you know, back then, questioning the accepted doctrines, especially from the church or Aristotle that could get you in serious trouble. Oh, yeah. But he went for it, carved his own path intellectually. He did. What do you think gave him that kind of, like, intellectual guts? I think, I think a key thing to remember is... If you look at his whole life, he really valued reason and observation. Okay. Studying theology probably gave him a structure for thinking logically. Yeah. But his natural curiosity pushed him beyond what everyone else believed. Right. He wasn't afraid to challenge the status quo, whether it was in, you know, science or how society worked. Yeah. This this independent thinking seems like it was just part of who he was. Which brings us to, I mean, this really big moment that your sources talked about. Mm -hmm. His speech to Pope Urban V in 1363. Oh, yeah. Talk about bold. Right. Yeah. He basically called out the church for being corrupt and living this super lavish lifestyle right there in front of the Pope. I mean, can you imagine? It's yeah. like a level of like conviction that's hard to even grasp. Absolutely. you got to think about the power dynamics at play there. Yeah. To speak so directly to the, the top guy in the church that was super risky. Yeah. The fact that he did it right in front of the Pope and the whole sacred college shows how much moral courage he had. Right. And while the sources don't really say what happened afterward, right. you know, the punishment for heresy back then could be brutal. Yeah. The fact that he kept his influence afterward yeah. makes you think that maybe even his opponents respected his intellect. Right. Or maybe the church decided to keep things quiet to avoid another scandal. That's interesting. And yet, even after this potential clash with, like, the highest religious authority, yeah. he ends up becoming a trusted advisor to King Charles V of France. He did. That's a pretty big turnaround. It's amazing, right. And what's fascinating is 
it seems like his intelligence kind of overshadowed all the controversy. Mm -hmm. The monarchy clearly valued his insights. Right. And on top of that, his work translating Aristotle's writings into French, that was huge. Okay, why was that such a big deal? Well, up until then, those essential texts were basically only for people who knew Latin. Oh, I see. By making them available in the language everyone spoke. Yeah. He made knowledge accessible to everyone right. and gave so many more people the chance to engage with these, you know, complex philosophical and scientific ideas. That makes sense. That alone had a big impact on the way people thought back then. Okay. So we see him challenging social and religious norms. Yeah. But let's dive into, you know, the scientific and philosophical stuff. Okay. Your sources mention him developing geometric models to actually measure intensities and speeds. Yes. In the 1300s, without the math we have now, what did that even look like? Imagine trying to explain, like, how the speed of something falling changes without algebra or calculus. Right. That's what Oresme was dealing with. Yeah. He basically invented a way to visualize those changes using geometry. Okay. Think of it like, you know, drawing a line where the height of the line shows you how strong a quality is at a specific moment. Okay. He used shapes to represent how these qualities changed over time or across a distance. And yours. This was a fundamental step towards being able to describe the physical world with math. Right. And laid the groundwork for, you know, how we understand physics today. And he even speculated that falling objects speed up at a constant rate, right? Yeah, he did. And even though he didn't have, you know, all the tools that Galileo had later on, mm -hmm. It shows that he was really paying attention and trying to model these natural events in a quantitative way. That's pretty impressive. It is. And this is where things get super exciting, especially given your, you know, love for data and visualization. Oh, yeah. His graphical methods. Yeah. The fact that he was basically using a coordinate system hundreds of years before Descartes, that's just wild. Can you break down like what his longitude and latitude system looked like and how he actually used it? Okay, so in his uh, big work, Tractatus de Configurationibus Quantitatum et Motum, right. Orisme came up with this idea of representing like the intensity of qualities, like heat or velocity, yeah. across you know a specific thing, whether it was a period of time or a physical object. Okay, the longitude was like the extent of that thing, yeah. kind of like our x-axis today. Right. Then at each point along that longitude, he draw a line perpendicular to it, okay. the latitude, mm -hmm. whose length showed the intensity of the quality at that point, similar to our axes. Okay. By connecting the ends of those latitudes, he created a shape or yeah. a configuration mm -hmm. that visually showed how the quality changed across the longitude. I see. Like, imagine showing uniformly accelerated motion. Okay. He would draw a right triangle where the base was time, that's the longitude, right. and the increasing height showed the increasing speed, that's the latitude, hmm. and the area of the triangle that represented the total distance travel. So even though it wasn't the exact same system we use now, with X and Y and precisely plotted points, yeah. the main idea showing how two variables relate on a two-dimensional plane was therein. That's a huge leap, right? Yeah. yeah. And the sources even point out that he used this to analyze accelerated motion. Yeah. Something we usually credit to Galileo way later. Exactly. And while, you know, Descartes is the one who gave us the formal algebraic system for analytic geometry. Yeah. Or Esme's geometric approach was a crucial step toward that. Makes sense. His work was all over intellectual circles in Europe. Mm -hmm. So it's very likely his ideas influenced later mathematicians and scientists. Right. Even if it's hard to trace a direct connection centuries later. Yeah. What's really important is that he understood the power of visuals yeah. as a tool to grasp abstract concepts and how they relate to each other. And as if that wasn't enough to make him a visionary, he also jumped into one of the biggest scientific debates of his time. Yeah. Does the Earth move? Yes. In a time where everyone thought the Earth was the center of everything, mm -hmm. he suggested that the way we see stars move could be because the Earth is rotating. He did. That's a radical idea, right? Yeah. It was a totally revolutionary idea, and he didn't just throw it out there. Mm -hmm. He built really smart arguments to address the objections people had, yeah. like, you know, the argument that if the Earth were spinning, we'd all be flung off. Yeah. Or Resme countered that by saying, well, everything on Earth is moving together, so we wouldn't feel it that way. I see. His analysis, in some ways, was like a preview of what Copernicus and Galileo would argue centuries later. Wow. It was that deep and insightful. So beyond these, like groundbreaking scientific 
ideas. Yeah. He also took a strong stance against superstitions, especially astrology. He did. It wasn't just some academic thing. It seems like he really wanted people to understand the world based on reason. Absolutely. Oresme was a big advocate for understanding the world in a natural way. Mm. He believed that things in nature had natural causes. Right. And he totally rejected explanations based on like divine intervention or what the stars said. In a society where people saw celestial events yeah. as omens mm -hmm. that directly affected their lives, yeah. his stance was a powerful call for reason, for thinking critically, and for the importance of observation. Uh, it was like a philosophical fight against fear and ignorance. Exactly. It's really amazing how his curiosity and insights span so many different areas. Yeah. Your sources even talk about his contributions to economics. They do. Specifically identifying the connection between inflation and debasing the currency. That's right. That's an economic principle that's still totally relevant today. It is. And his understanding of economic principles shows just how incredibly broad his intellect was. Right. And in math, his work on the rules for combining exponents and his proof of the divergence of the harmonic series were significant. Yeah. Those were big advancements that influenced how people thought about math for generations. He was a true polymath. Yeah, he was. His work laid the foundation for so many different fields. Yeah. So bringing it back to this idea of Oresme and coordinate systems. Yeah, okay. Let's really drive home how groundbreaking that was for you, the listener. I mean, using longitude and latitude to visually show relationships between quantities. Right. It's such a basic concept in how we analyze and understand data today. It is. Imagine trying to make sense of complex information without being able to see it. Yeah. Or resume basically gave us the first glimpse of that powerful tool. Exactly. Think about how important visual data representation is in our world today. Yeah. Every chart, every graph you see, it owes something to thinkers like Oresme. Wow. His Tractatus has really clear examples of how he used the system to depict changes in qualities. Right. Like, imagine showing how the intensity of heat changes along a metal bar. Okay. The longitude would be the length of the bar, mm -hmm. and the latitude would show the temperature at each point. Okay. Being able to turn abstract data into visuals like that was huge for human understanding. It's like he gave us an early blueprint for how we make sense of information in the 21st century. Yeah. And even though Rene Descartes is the one we usually credit with making analytic geometry official, it seems pretty clear that Oresme's work was a crucial step toward that and probably influenced Descartes. Most likely. The fact that his writings were everywhere in intellectual circles suggests that these ideas were out there, mm. maybe planting the seeds for what Descartes did later. Yeah. It shows how intellectual progress often happens in steps Right. With people building on what came before, even if we don't always remember those who came before. Exactly. The history of how ideas develop, it's rarely a straight line. Right. Breakthroughs often come from a series of small steps, mm -hmm. with each thinker building on what others have discovered. Makes sense. Oresme's work is a great example of this, showing that the basic idea for something as important as graphical representation was around centuries before we had the math to express it. So... As we wrap up this deep dive into the amazing life and mind of Nicola Resme, a few key things really stand out. Yeah. Here's a guy who, despite starting with nothing and facing the intellectual limits of the 14th century, showed incredible resilience, challenged the accepted wisdom in so many areas. He did. And made groundbreaking contributions. Yeah. Especially with his early version of graphing techniques. What's really striking from the sources you shared is his endless curiosity and how brave he was in questioning what everyone thought was true. Yeah. He wasn't afraid to explore new intellectual territory. Right. Whether it was thinking about the earth spinning or inventing new ways to visualize abstract concepts, mm -hmm. his life reminds us that even if you face adversity, you can still achieve great things intellectually. Absolutely. Like He used his challenges as fuel to keep learning and understanding. And it makes us think about our own perspectives, right? Yeah. Like, what assumptions are we just accepting in our own lives and the things we're interested in? Good question. Where are we hesitant to question the way everyone thinks? Yeah. Or Resume's example is like a call to action, mm -hmm. to be relentless in how we learn and to stand by what we believe, mm. even when people disagree or doubt us. Absolutely. And it, it leads to a really interesting question for you to think about. What's that? How would our understanding of the history of science and ideas be different if we gave more credit to thinkers like 
Nicole or Resme, yeah. who were working centuries before the big names we usually think of from the scientific revolution, right. maybe we'd have a richer, more complete view of how human understanding has evolved mm. and a better appreciation for the long and winding road that got us where we are today. And all the people who helped pave that road, even the ones we don't always hear about. Exactly. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have for this week's deep dive. Yeah. See you next time. See you then.